we aren't so bad. But, you know, at the, at the bottom line is it doesn't matter about your skin color. You can agree or disagree with anyone's opinion. You can fight them on intellect or whatever it is, but there's just no need to bring skin color in. So, yeah, I, I literally just, I didn't know what to do. So I thought, the first thing was I left it and a few hours went by, but it was just really kind of eating away at me. Like, how can someone so powerful and influential who has no need to even do this, like you have such a huge following, so much love from your fans, why would you even want to do this? Like, okay, you might do it behind the scenes, and, and I get that. That's, that's, you know, that, that's maybe something that happens, but why present that publicly? I just couldn't get my head around it. And Hello and welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today I am very lucky to have Depeche Mandalia on. Uh, Depeche is someone that came on my radar right when I first started in this, in this game because I saw him just posting incredible value about Facebook ads. The guy really knows his stuff, uh, you know, more than most people out there when it comes to Facebook ads. He's, he's really in with Facebook. He's got a great relationship with Facebook and that shines through in everything he says. So I wanted to have him on, you know, even before... Uh, any of this 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 hubbub kind of kind of happened over over the weekend, but then then there was th this issue with uh, with Grant Cardone, which we'll get into a little bit um, and, and to discuss it because I really think it it shows a lot of really interesting things that are happening in the space right now. And uh, so first and foremost, we have Depeche on for his amazing knowledge of Facebook, but we'll get into all sorts of other topics here. Depeche, welcome to the program. How you doing? Thanks, Eric. Uh, absolute pleasure to be on your show. Uh, big fan of yours as well. I think you know the stuff you've done with the community and. Um, the, the kind of conference and stuff is really inspiring. So, Thank absolute pleasure to be here. Yeah, great. Well, will you come to Barcelona? I'm actually going to be abroad. Otherwise, I would have been there. Um, I'll be in Canada potentially. If I'm not, then I'll be in Barcelona. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's right. You do. You spend some some significant time in Alberta, in Edmonton. Is that what it was? In Calgary. So we've got family yeah. out there. So um, we absolutely love it out there. To spend time out there if we can, at least once a year, if not every other year. So it's it's awesome. Nice. Okay, so your current gig. So we're going to cover your, your hero's journey, where you come from, what your what your background is with Facebook ads, uh, and then we'll get into some more of the juicy details. So let's do that quickly. So you're the founder of SMC, which is like a, a commerce agency. So we um, actually started off in 2012 as affiliates marketers. That's where the kind of business came about. And actually, interesting story about that is I started off with affiliate marketing, just doing it as a side hustle quickly and unexpectedly made a lot of money and then figured out shit i'm gonna to have to buy, put uh, put money into taxes and stuff and that's like when i kind of realized how uh, important it is to get your accounts in place and we paid paid a um a, a big sum for our taxes that year and then we figured out we needed a company to back that out so that's where it all started off from very interesting so what were your first big wins in the affiliate space on facebook um, so actually, we did affiliate through organic only. So Facebook ads kind of came, came a few years later. So um, back in 2009, what triggered it was actually when I was working for a hotel company and running their SEO and website conversion, I got involved with affiliate marketing just purely because our affiliate marketers were doing such a great job, but they needed help to get their landing pages working better benefiting them and benefiting us. So I got a lot more involved with the affiliate space just through that. And what blew me away was how much commission they were making. Like this one affiliate was making five figures a month just from us. And I said, like, how many companies do you work with? You know, 10, 20, 30 companies. I was like, wow. And like, what do you do? And he's like, you know, we do SEO, we do lead gen, we do X, Y, Z. So that got me into um, looking into further into affiliate marketing. So I spent a good few years reading up, for joining forums, just trying to figure out, you know, what what is the secret behind it? Like, it's I know SEO, I know website conversion, I know content marketing. Why can't I just do this? And then the kind of um, the magic happened, and all of a sudden, I went from kind of just running a few different blogs and just trying to drive traffic to see what happened, to actually finding a, a little formula that worked. And my little hack was to play with big brand searches, but to pull off all the long tail searches, which they weren't bothered about. And, you know, those long tail searches, they're small numbers, but they convert really, really well. And that's where I literally made my money. Um, and actually, in 2012, when Google made significant changes in their, um, in, in their algorithms, Panda and Penguin hit, it hit people like me who 
for all intents and purposes, we were bottom feeders. We were, we were feeding out all those kind of keywords that brands weren't interested in. Google changed the game and they said, if the brand search is there, then the brand should own it. And we were just knocked out the water. I made huge, huge mistakes. Number one, I took my foot off the gas when it came to SEO. I thought I was, you know, I had a seven figure business. I felt I, I can step, step back now and I can hire someone to actually run my SEO. Big, big mistake. Um, that person massively screwed up and gave me a ton of bad links. Number two, I wasn't list building. I was just driving traffic to all these affiliate sites. Um, and all of a sudden it came crashing down. I didn't have a list, like a few, th a few thousand. I had a fan page and just a few thousand people there compared to like the hundreds of thousands, if not the millions of visits we were sending, it was a drop in the ocean. So huge mistakes. I had no idea what I was doing. It all crashed and I just lost absolute faith in um, affiliate marketing SEO. And it was at that time I started to dabble with Facebook ads in 2012 and lost a fair amount of money in the, in the kind of few years after that. And then in 2014, I found something which actually worked, started to do a bit more testing. And I remember like the first spend um, we made profit on, we spent 6K and made 10K back. And, th and that was just like, even though it was just barely break even, that was like, wow, we can actually do something here. The following month, we spent 10K and made 50K back. And this was a, this was a print on demand e-com site. And that's it, our mind was blown. Like we, we can't get this kind of return anywhere else. And literally the rest was history from then on. Amazing. So what were you, so tell me about those first two years where you weren't c crushing it. Were you working at another job at that time and doing this on the side or was this your livelihood? I th yeah, this was working um, as, as a digital marketer for companies and trying to, you know, like, like I was reading about Facebook ads and people, some people were making money, some people were still trying to make sense of it. Literally like the first year of running Facebook ads, I didn't know that you could do anything more than page boosting. That was that that for me was just Facebook ads, and yeah. I didn't really quite get it. Like you know, I was doing a lot. I was spending millions on paid search at that point, and and running big affiliate campaigns and TV campaigns. I just couldn't get my head around a why would someone buy from Facebook, and you know the the way you get ads in front front of people. Like where's the control? Where's the ability to target? So a year went just kind of wheel spinning. Um, it, was, it was around the kind of mid to back end of 2013 that I started to get my head around it. And then early 2014, I got deeper into the platform um, and, and just everything just kind of came together. Like, I, I don't know if you kind of recall, but early 2014, the Facebook ads platform actually ran off a, a plug in on Chrome. There was no kind of ads platform yeah. at that time. And the whole account management was a mess. You had one campaign and you had ads running in the um, campaign. There was no structure. The thing that really sparked for me was bringing in some structure from paid search. So in AdWords, you had the same concept of an, a campaign, but you had ad groups and you had keywords in those ad groups. I started to apply that with Facebook and had campaigns which were all targeted around a particular audience and put ads in them. And all of a sudden, the, the, the stuff started happening and it started to work. So it really took off from there. And that's just about compartmentalizing what, you're, what you want from the Facebook algorithm, giving it you know, sort of manageable chunks telling just being more specific about what you want it to do and that's that's sort of the genesis i think of of of, of you know how you get success on facebook overall absolutely and i think at that time even facebook themselves didn't really understand how to make facebook ads work and you know there were lots of early pioneers that were making it work but they weren't sharing their formulas and secrets and all that kind of stuff like the level of information available right now in forums and on youtube everything there was none of that um, or barely like a, a scratch of what there is available now. And, and, and so people were wasting money and it was really hard to figure out how to make it work. Yeah, for sure. So, so describe your business now. You're, 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 are you still running e-commerce projects through your own company? Are you, are, you lev are you working with clients more? What does your business look like at this point? Sure. So over the kind of last three, four years, I've been doing consulting. So I've been what you might call growth marketing. So I brought in all the kind of knowledge of marketing but still kept a strong focus on Facebook ads, especially since 2014, when over an 18-month period, uh, 18 month period, I took that e-com store from six to eight figures. And, and that was absolutely mind-blowing. That got me on the radar of Facebook. Uh, we became the poster child of the small medium business team. And we were paraded. You know, I've done lots of talks for Facebook, their roadshows internally, invited out to Menlo Park. Like the whole thing exploded. And so I started to focus a lot more on Facebook ads. But then in 2016, I was working um, for a company and I needed to hire up a Facebook ads agency in London. And I spoke to quite a few different agencies. And what was apparent is that, the, that there was always a lack of kind of understanding of how to make Facebook ads work. 
And I came from a position of actually knowing how to make ads work. So I was really scrutinizing these agencies who were the typical digital marketing agency that would bolt on a new service. And I could just tell that they just didn't get it. Um, I did find a really good agency, but then actually just something sparked, like I could do this, I could fill a gap here. And so in 2017, um, I switched SM Commerce from a consultancy to just focus on Facebook ads and literally just taken off from there. So first three months, we, we grew to something like 12 clients, team of seven. Inbound lead gen has never been a problem because I do so much networking. I do startup support, now kind of online forums and things like that. So I've not spent anything ever on lead gen. But the problem for me has been this whole new learning process of how to actually run an agency. Like that is... I, I know Facebook ads inside out agency. I am still a novice. So th this is kind of bringing all of that together um, and, and now kind of switching our service from just focusing on managing clients to now training them up as well. And so that's kind of the next step in the uh, the rung for us as a company is to focus more on training. That's that's super interesting. And that, yeah, that, I can see that being a massive trend with uh, with this knowledge being so valuable. You know, Facebook just turns the reins of power over to people to such a high level that uh, it's imperative that as organizations you you, you kind of you get your hands around it. Um, Absolutely. Very very cool. So are you still running that print on demand business? Um, no. So that was um, that was the owners, the founders. I was working for them as a consultant, so it wasn't my business. Okay. Um, so I was there as a consultant, and literally it was only like a two week project. I was only supposed to come in, help them set up digital marketing, and move off. Um, and that turned out to almost been a two year um, role there. So, you know, they're, they're doing phenomenally well now. They've just expanded out um, internationally and it's, it's completely taken off. And so for me, it was about finding the next project. Now, that company actually ended up being a, a company of 100 people. And, wow. and it was Are you able to mention them? Uh, lost my name. So they um, created children's personalized books. Now they're called Wonderbly. But I didn't want to work for a company with 100 people because it's, although they still wanted to maintain that startup mentality, it wasn't the kind of get your hands involved, nitty gritty style that I had helped to get them up. And I kind of found my niche, which was working with small and medium sized businesses, helping them to step up and scale up. And so that's where I wanted to go back. And that's why I kind of ended up, ended up moving away and then working with different companies to help them try and scale up. Very cool. So, uh, I want to start with lead with value always, and I think that's what you do with your group. Your, let's name drop your group here. Uh, it's Facebook Ad Academy. It's Facebook Ads Academy for Entrepreneurs and Marketers. Nice, and I think you're just always on there, yeah, dropping tons of value. I think you've got a really unique perspective on things. Um, so what what do you think people? I, I just I just was reading over some of your posts uh, today, and and I was I was talking about or I was reading about your comments on scaling right now and how what, what, a, what a tricky position we're in. So let's, maybe let's start just your sort of view on Facebook right now and, and how they're having to behave in light of, of the, the, the constant barrage. Like it's pretty amazing. Every day there's a new little attack here. You know, on the weekend I saw something about Mark Zuckerberg trying to get a hold of people's medical records which for some sort of like you know, really a potentially beneficial product where, where people could, you know, the, medic, the medical community could leverage anonymously people's, people's data and, and learn so much more ab about the efficacy of treatments and things like that. So it's really sort of like a, what's the word I'm looking for, but like a, a, a good focus that, that they have, mm. I think, at their core, but they're just being attacked day in and day out. So what's your read on the situation right now? So I think there's a few things. Number one is Facebook is such a huge um, beast at the moment that with the amount of data they hold, the level of responsibility is like unheard of. Um, the, the, that now the kind of governments is finding loopholes and they're finding the Cambridge Analytica situations and people are complaining and stuff. It's forcing Facebook to really, really step up their data and privacy game. So I spoke last week to a radio show about the Analytica situation. Mm -hmm. And what that's done is there's a few, you know, Facebook have made a few mistakes. Two years ago when the breach happened and Facebook found out, they should have, A, banned Cambridge Analytica from Facebook. And, and you'll know full well that you, you make the smallest infraction as an affiliate marketer or as an e-com guy, your account gets shut down. Now, imagine a company that's stolen millions of records illegally. They were allowed to still continue advertising on Facebook, and that was an absolute big mistake. And so that, you know, two years on is caught up with Facebook. They had an opportunity to nip this in the bud two years ago, 
ban Cambridge Analytica, say, fix up all the loopholes and kind of move on, and they haven't done. So I think they've made a huge mistake. But on the positive front, it's going to make it a lot better for the user. And, you know, Facebook's big thing is always about the user. I talk a lot about, when I talk about um, how to make Facebook ads work, my number one rule is focus on the user. Make the user's experience as good as it can be because that's what Facebook is all about. Then you work around what you need off the back of it. So you look at the user's goal, you look at your goal, and how do you bridge that gap to bring them there? So whether it's your ads, your targeting, your landing page, it's obvious when you talk about it, but so many people focus on what they want out of the user and they'll try and push them it straight into sale and all those kind of things. Um, but I think you know Facebook are... I really do think that Facebook is an amazing company. I don't, don't say that just because of the work I do with them, but I, I see internally the projects they're working on, some of the kind of ideas where you know Zuckerberg wants to take Facebook. You've got virtual reality. You've got augmented reality. You've got big internet reach across the whole world. Facebook, I think, is the, the kind of um, – big change in the world that we've seen over the last five to ten years that's changing the way we communicate it's, it's absolutely taken us forward now imagine if tomorrow facebook were forced to close down and and you know the impact that would have on society is huge you know i know for example um people who are homebound so they can't go and socialize they can't go and um spend time in in a bar or a restaurant and things like that they absolutely rely on Facebook to be their eyes into the world. So they want to keep in touch with their friends and things like that. Um, and, you, you know, you think about the marketing, the commercial impact on businesses. Where would they take their money? Like, where else can you get the same, same kind of return that you can on Facebook? Facebook, I don't think, is going to go away anytime soon. The data and privacy thing that we're seeing right now with custom audiences and partner categories and things like that, it's, it's closing up loopholes. And certainly for advertisers, it's going to make it a lot more, it's already made it a lot more difficult for us to do the things that we um, have been doing. So taking a custom audience and putting into audience insights and finding out how many people are there, what their interests are, it's becoming a lot more difficult. But we have to adapt and we have to kind of roll with the punches and figure out better ways to kind of make this happen. And like you touched on scaling, for example, one of the things that I highlighted um, recently is in the six years of advertising on Facebook, I've never seen the auction so volatile. Like all the things that I've been doing and practicing, uh, generally, yeah, you see some fluctuations in the auction where sometimes your CPMs are higher, sometimes they're lower, but not to this level. And I think that everything that's going on with advertisers being unsure and um, the data thing that's going on. And also Facebook are also testing different things out in the auction. Um, that's all coming together almost at the wrong time. And, and that's making things extremely difficult to get the predictability that people want out of it. Yeah. It, it, there's, a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. I wanted to go back to, to close to the beginning when, you, when we talked about the breach. And early on, when, when this came out, I feel like, was it really a breach? Was it actually a breach or was it, wasn't, it the, wasn't it designed to be that way? Wasn't like the social graph yeah. was sort of like the idea was, and this is what I love about Facebook, and this is my take on, on this whole thing. You talked about the responsibility that Facebook has as an organization because of all the data that they have. It isn't because they have so much data. They need to be so careful is because, because they turn that data over to everyone. Mm. They're the most, and that's why I think... You know, people people aren't talking about the NSA right now, who has your Facebook feed, your credit card feed, your you know all all these security forces around the world that sort of have the full picture, the full spectrum of data that you know around you, and they're probably building some kind of profile or, or around that. Facebook is the only one that turns that data over to every person to the point where so, an agency over here could manipulate a, a, a an election or. Or someone who has a product ideal in in two weeks could scale to six, seven figures, you know? And, and so to me, it's, it's, it's not just that they have all this data. It's the fact that they're democratic with it. And I think that's what's so great about it. So when they said data breach, when they came out early on and said, uh, we've, had, we've had this data breach, I thought that was a, a huge mistake in a way. And I think they kind of had to fall on their sword at mm. that time. But really, the philosophy of the social graph at that time was that, that the, sort of this data is a, is a public asset and we give people... Uh, you know, a, a lot of access to it, and all the apps at that time had that the same the same access, and and so the breach was far bigger than Cambridge Analytica's, if you want to call it a breach. Yeah, absolutely. So where where Cambridge Analytica went against those terms was there there was a professor that had created an app, and so within that app, he wanted to profile people um, and kind of get data from their social profile to kind of 
um, mesh that into their responses. Now, what he also did was to tap into their friends. So although only, I think, a quarter of a million people downloaded the app, which for an app install isn't a huge number, yeah. through, through the connections, and, and now it's only just come out this week, that he managed to get access to 87 million people's profiles. Now, you know, if you look at that, and you, you've mentioned that it was anonymized data, you might think, you know, what, what's the harm in that? The harm in that is twofold. Number one, the amount of data modeling you can do on that kind of scale, even on 250,000 is quite um, intense, but to get 87 million data points, and probably more because of all the kind of sub-attributes, and then to start picking up trends on human behavior and how people interact with brands and with other people. There was just so much data there, it was unheard of. Now, the problem was that Cambridge Analytica took that data and worked, you know, they used it for commercial purposes, and that was never permitted. Now, when Facebook found out that the professor had actually taken this data, they did say, you know, what are you doing with this? We can see that you've got full access to this. And, and the response was, it's just academic research. Mm -hmm. And so that's where Facebook backed off. Now, what actually then happened is he took that to Cambridge Analytica. They then used it for commercial purposes. Facebook then found out and told Cambridge Analytica, you're not allowed to use that data. You need to delete that data. Did they then follow up to make sure they deleted it? I don't think they did. And that's, what, that's where a big part of this problem came up is... Once Cambridge Analytica had that data, who knows how many copies were made, where it was put, and who had access to it. Facebook, I don't believe, followed that up, and that was a big problem, which, you know, w whether it had an impact on the uh, U.S. elections or um, the U.K. referendum, we'll never know. But there are strong um, calls and kind of internal whistleblowers and all these kind of information pieces coming out that there is a good chance that the data was used to influence these elections, not directly by running Facebook ads, but by manipulating data points in different different media, so in, in kind of physical and digital and things like that, and bringing that together to essentially create fake news, but not fake news that isn't, um, you know, just kind of not, not just fabricated, but fake news which is targeted to you based on knowing what your trigger points are. Yeah. So as a sim simple example, they, um, th there was a whistleblower that spoke to The Guardian and they said that people that liked the page I Hate Jews also had a high correlation for um, Kit Kat and Nike. Now, what do you do with that kind of data? Well, actually, what you could do is if you were targeting a specific demographic and they had a big um, trust of a company like Nike, you could pay Nike and, and kind of get them to endorse a product that kind of subvers subversively starts to target people and get them to influence their decision making to believe something that isn't true and and that's the big problem and that's where the concerns came out of the data yeah so you you had these you had these ads or pages that were being run that were playing on people's uh you know xenophobia for instance i know that was a big Absolutely. thing with uh, with brexit and i'm sure with trump as well um, it didn't work for Cruz. They didn't because I know they ran on Ted Cruz's campaign, and he got slaughtered by a guy who who didn't do anything at that time. So mm -hmm. the efficacy of it and the amount to which it was actually used, I think, is a is a really Absolutely. interesting point. Um, and uh, yeah, I, Victoria has some some interesting ties to to all of this with uh, with the aggregate IQ company being in Victoria, and there's there's a lot of stuff kind of flying around uh, he, here. Uh, I met actually a guy who was a data scientist early on, and he told me. I told Alexander Nix this too, actually, when I when I met him because I introduced him on stage at a, at an event. And he, this this guy who was a data scientist told me because basically what you do is you run these surveys, and the answers to the questions subtly reveal things about you. The, 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 the right. set of questions are designed to reveal something, you know, an opinion or or something you're likely to hold, and then you can you know you use Facebook's analytics to find more people who are likely to be in that same bucket. But he told me a really interesting thing. He said that they they dusted off this data. I, I, I don't know if it's called like a rubric or something, but it's like a data template in a way. That it was a seven-question series that, was, that they found was the best uh, question template in order to reveal uh, whether someone was going to be a Trump voter. And the actual thing was this was a seven-question series from the 1970s that was used to determine how likely someone was to accept totalitarian rule. Wow. <laughs> so that's a little, that's a little scary. Um, but it... it yeah, but again, you know, this stuff is open to everyone, a little bit less so. 
But you know, when you're talking about them not following up with with the way that they use this data, that all comes that's custom audiences, right? They really have no way of knowing what you're uploading there, where you got it, whether you have license mm-hmm. to it. And so do you think that's going to be one of the, the the most like powerful like immediate repercussions about all this is just really limiting the way custom audiences can be used? It's already started. So GDPR, which has kicked off in the EU and now impacting um, pretty much every country that wants to trade with the EU, it's causing big challenges and big headaches for companies because there's no clear guidance on what's right and what's wrong. So, you know, for example, in the affiliate marketing industry, um, they have kind of white, um, um, white hat techniques of capturing emails and then also kind of black hat techniques as well. And they sell on these email lists to companies that either want to directly target or build custom audiences. And Facebook knows this. And Facebook are trying to make sure that they're covering their own backs because if, let's say, someone did upload an email list that was obtained without consent, it comes down on Facebook because the data is being pushed into the Facebook system and you're using Facebook to then target these people. And so there's going to be a big, big crackdown on the type of data that you're able to upload. And I think there there will be some repercussion and you'll have to go even further to prove you have consent for these email addresses. You know, for example, when you're doing lead gen ads, I've been speaking to them recently, like if I do a lead gen ad and I collect the email from Facebook, do I need to again ask them for consent because they've given it to Facebook and then they've given it to me as the advertiser and I can't get a straight answer. And mm-hmm. so like, what, where do you take that? Do I now need to tell all my clients that are doing lead gen forms that yes, you need to get the email address and then you need to send them an email and then get them to confirm and then you can email them properly, which looks like the route you're taking, but it's like extra hurdles and loopholes that are probably going to have a negative impact on the user experience that are probably going to result in um, lower click-through rates and open rates and things like that. So I think there will be repercussions like that. Interesting. So just a quick note about lead, our, our Facebook lead, I, we've used a few Facebook lead gen ads for some of our courses and things like that. Are they, are they far superior to just running traditional lead gen forms? Um, as in lead gen forms on a website? Like lead gen ad types, I mean, like specific ad types for lead gen on Facebook. Yeah, the so lead I mean form like... form is built into the ad. Yeah, so um, I've done lots of experimentation on this. The general consensus from the data is you can get far cheaper cost per lead by going through the Facebook lead form than off-site. But the, 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 the quality and the value differs. And hmm. I, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. So we're working with a client right now. We've literally just closed a two-week launch window, half a million. And for the uh, four or five months prior to that, we've purely been collecting email leads through Facebook. Um, and we've been doing kind of sub $2 cost per leads for these guys, collecting, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of email addresses. Now, the I'm, I'm pretty positive that there's a huge number of emails there that are not as high quality as the ones that did convert. Because looking at our campaigns in that two-week window – some of the responses were not as good as we'd have hoped. Um, and so I do think that you do need to test this for your, for your own company. There are other cases where lead gen, the quality is just not good enough to offset the cost saving. And so then, you know, if you take them through the website, yes, you'll have a lower conversion rate, you'll have a slightly higher you know, cost per lead, but the quality of that lead is far better because they've gone through the landing page experience. And, you know, you if you... There's two sides of the story. Do you just want every single email address of someone that could be interested, or do you want the email addresses of people that are likely to buy? And mm-hmm. so it's kind of weighing those two things up, I think, as well. And you know, for this recent launch client, they just wanted email addresses of people that were interested because, A, they wanted to remarket to as much, many of those as possible through email and retargeting. But secondly, they said, look, if we're going to create lookalike audiences, then all email addresses are good because if we've targeted them and they've reacted to this, um, offer of a free PDF, then they're our target market, whether they're going to buy or not. Yeah, that, that's that's an interesting trade-off there because yeah, you get the ease of use of the Facebook lead lead forms, but yeah, but but where is the intent after they if they haven't seen the the, the full page? And obviously, Facebook is going to prioritize their ad formats as well, right? That's right. They're, they're going to give those a boost in the in the algorithm, obviously. Yeah. Um, before we get into the Cardone stuff, I just want to talk a little bit about scaling because you, 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 I, I saw one of your posts about about what the scaling environment looks like now. And, and, and you know, we're, we're working on a big e-commerce project right now and we're talking with different people about the different sort of philosophies about scaling, about, you know, Facebook does allow you to scale hard and fast, like more so than any other maybe, maybe platform out there. But what are the things that people need to know 
about scaling hard and fast on Facebook right now? Do you have to take a more tempered approach where you want to scale to, you know, you want to, you, you don't want to just have your pedal down on the, on the floor. You want to sort of like rev it up and, and, and kind of keep it going. What's, what are, what's your philosophy on scaling right now? Um, so actually my philosophy is based on my experience running foreign exchange trading. So something like 10 years ago, I started doing currency tra- um, trading where I was buying up, you know, USD, selling GBP, et cetera, et cetera. And I really feel that my success on Facebook, especially when it comes to trading, has come down to that and having a trader's mindset. Now, you know, when you talk to people and they, you, you say mindset is so important, they're like, don't give me that kind of airy fairy stuff. Just tell me how to scale. But you need to know where are your entry points, where are your cutoff points, how much are you willing to risk and how much you're lo- willing to tolerate losses before you make gains. You know, like, for example, if you're going to scale up fast, the, the algorithm, the auction needs to catch up. You need to give it a day, two days, three days to normalize and then see where the performance is. Now, when you're spending upwards of 5, 10K a day, those losses are magnified. And so are you willing to wait for the auction to give you a positive response or not? If you're not, then you have to t- kind of taper down your expectations and work on your risk and reward level as well. So, and a lot of that comes through confidence. If you've been scaling up an account over many days, weeks and months, then you're, you've got the confidence that you've got the pulse of the account. I talk a lot about the pulse because, you know, I, I get lots of questions saying, I want to use your formula to scale up. And my, my feedback is, you can have it. I can write it down to a T, but every account reacts differently. The audiences, your bidding, your history, there's so much that comes into it that you need to know what data points to look at and to know when you need to exit because, um, one of the posts I mentioned today was we, we're working with a client right now and they want to absolutely get to 5K a day. We've scaled them up um, to, to close to 3K over the last week and over the weekend it's dropped down to $1,500 um, a day because our rules have cut off the ads that are not performing. We're focusing on both profitability and revenue. Now, if we didn't have rules in place, we'd have continued spending 2, 3K and we'd have made bigger losses. Now, for this particular client, we want to minimize losses. So we've gone back down to 1500 and we'll then scale it up this week, back up to three grand, and then look to scale it up further from that. Whereas, you know, if, if you're willing to take a bit more of a risk, you might ride those days where you're not having the same profit as you'd expect, and, and the auction may or may not recover. But like I mentioned earlier, the, the auction's in such a flux, and it has been over the last few months, that the expected behavior that I've seen in the past just isn't reacting like it like it has. So, you know, what I would say is understand your level of risk um, and then play your um, scaling strategy based on how much you're willing to uh, take a loss before you get the results that you need to build the confidence up to build from as well. Very cool. And but there, as far as I understand from my pulse on the industry, there was the expected CPM drop. Like after the after at the start of the new, like you can just you can kind of set your watch to that a little bit, absolutely, right? Like absolutely. Costs are going to go massive before the end of the quarter, and they're going to drop at, right. at, at the beginning of the new quarter. Yeah. Um, for now, and that's just from that's just brand dollars. You think that that flood into the space and and take a while to to warm up and and to eat up all absolutely. the all this. So, so the first time I experienced that was in uh, 2015, and um, we were spending significant sums at that point. Um, and I did get insight from a Facebook strategist that they're aware of this. They're aware of big, big, back, big brands dropping big budgets at the end of um, March because the if they don't spend it, they lose it. And it's all commission-based, so they want to make sure that they're maximizing reach and things like that. Um, and I've also been told by a huge media buyer working for one of the biggest agencies in the world, there's only like a handful of agencies doing this. This is not like a big influx of big um, companies and agencies. It's just a handful that do this. And so that has a big impact on the auction. And if, if people have noticed from 1st and 2nd and 3rd of April, CPMs have come down. But what, what hasn't changed is the uh, conversion rates that people are seeing they are still fluctuating, and that's the biggest problem. So regardless of your costs coming down, I, I really think that there's something going on in the background with Facebook that they're not able to give you the consistency that they have been over the last few years. You think because they're, they're, they're taking their hands off of some of the advanced targeting capabilities or they're, they're experimenting maybe with, their, with the level of, of effectiveness of their targeting because of all the, the bad press? I think a combination of both, but I think they are looking to optimize the um, auction. So I saw a white paper which was released. Um, I don't think it was meant to be public, but they're looking at 
increasing the quality of the ad placements so that you're able to get higher conversions for lower spend. And, you know, that's like the ultimate goal for you to make sure that you're spending less and getting more out of it. And if that means that you're then spending less, potentially there's more auction space. So what Facebook are looking at right now is how can they open up more space? You know, there's been talk about running ads in groups, for example. Marketplaces just come up. Um, there, there was this kind of click to um, WhatsApp uh, CTA that came up. So they're looking at different ways of monetizing the platforms to give you even more reach. But the problem is, like, how, how do they keep on providing this? Because the more reach they give... People like me and you are just going to keep plowing in more money. We're not going to step back and say, right, we're happy spending this amount. This amount. We're just going to keep putting money in. So that's the the, the challenge that Facebook have right now. Um, and, and they're trying to balance that between giving good inventory and giving good response in terms of targeting and conversion. At the same time, users are becoming wary of some of the strategies that have been used in the past. And um, I put a lot of the blame on drop shippers. You know, you look at some of the ads that are out there that have been performing over the last few years, they've, they've slowly stopped um, performing because users are getting worn of the same old um, strategy of uh, video and some emojis and just some short text and things like that. So there's lots of things that are kind of challenging each other which are causing what's happening right now in the auction. Yeah, uh, and, and then having bad customer experiences and then becoming wary of, of everything. Yeah, it's a really and, interesting and, 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 field. Yeah, and actually, look, you, you know, one of the recent um, tools that Facebook have put out is being able to review the purchase that you just recently made. Like, why would they do that? Why would they care? Well, the thing is, because dropshippers, um, and, you know, I, I've, I've done a bit of dropshipping, so I'm, I'm as guilty. Dropshippers have affected the quality of the user experience. And so Facebook want to make sure that they are demoting those that are essentially giving people a bad experience. Yeah. Uh, you know, you mentioned there, uh, and this will be my, my subtle bridge here, you mentioned, you know, our reaction when Facebook raises their prices or maybe diminishes our access to our audiences will be to spend more because we recognize that that's where our, our benefit is. But that wasn't the case for Grant Cardone over the, uh, over the weekend here. Can we, can we talk a little bit about that? I know, I know you've probably talked about it a lot. I'm sure you've gotten a lot of, of messages about it, but I think there's, there's a lot going on in this particular issue. So why don't, why don't you set the stage and tell us sort of what happened with, with uh, Mr. Grant Cardone this weekend? Sure, absolutely. So um, Grant Cardone posted up, I think maybe Thursday, I think it was Thursday, a message on his page, and it was, Dear Facebook Execs, I want to leave Facebook. You are penalizing me on my organic reach. I've already spent a ton of money with you. You're making me spend more. Um, you know, this is basically extortion. You're trying to squeeze more money out of advertisers that are already spending a lot of money with you. And therefore, I'm going to leave Facebook. Now, the long and short of it is he's still on Facebook. He's still advertising. He's still running his videos and things like that. It's probably a, mar a PR ploy. Now, I saw that, and as someone who's read his text, so I haven't really seen much of his videos, but I've read his text, and I, I like some of the kind of hustle and grind and stuff like that. There's some, there's some interesting stuff in his material. And so I've been following him for a few months, and I responded to his um, page, which had already like hundreds of comments on it and thousands of likes. So I didn't expect any kind of response. And I said, hey, look, um, the problem you've got right now is your posts that you've been posting up over the last few months are tripping the Facebook filter on engagement base. Now, end of last year, Facebook were quite specific that they're cutting down on engagement bait because of the low user value. Um, you know, like, share, comment to do this, all that kind of stuff has been massively demoted. So my feedback to Grant was, A, this is what's happened, and B, rather than complaining to Facebook, you need to review your social media team because if after four months of 2018, they've not adapted their strategy, they need to change something up. So then he, he responded and said, oh yeah, you know, you just, um, and th this was all on um, his Facebook wall on his page. His response was, you know, people like you, you just follow the rules, you're not willing to change them. Now, if you know anything about Grant Condone, he's, he talks a lot about the rule changes that he's enforced. So one of them is, for example, he enforced the airlines to allow us to use our mobiles on the airplane. I saw that to, in this follow. Yeah, um, I, I, interesting. Which is great. Um, he also moved um, his location from California to somewhere else, to Miami, I think, because they increased land tax or something like that. So he's willing to take action and fight for a cause, which is absolutely amazing. 
but this isn't a fight which I believe Grant needed to make. It's, Facebook are not doing this to extort money. They're, using, they're doing this to improve the user value. And so I fed that back to him. So I responded back and said, no, well, actually, you know, if, if, if you take the amount of love you're getting from your audience, the great content you've got, and make a slight shift to your content strategy, I guarantee you'll get a 1,000x um, improvement in your engagement. You know, he's getting hundreds of likes. I think he should be getting hundreds of thousands of likes um, from an audience of six million people. And so he responded back and said, I'd like to interview you about, I'd like to interview you about this. And I was like, wow, that's like unbelievable. I was, I was really, really stoked. I was like beyond excited yeah. that this Because you were providing who, value. You had nothing in your mind other absolutely. than I'm going to provide this guy who I kind of like some value. Absolutely. So I was like, I shared it on my Facebook, on my LinkedIn. You can have a look at the timeline. I was like... You know, if someone asks you for help and you, you say, absolutely, yes, and I'm going to jump on a call with this guy and explain to him about how this works. And I was super, super excited. Now, over, I think then on Friday, someone tagged me in one of my own posts and said, oh, here's a video um, Grant's just done, and he's actually mentioned you. So I was like, oh, wow, well, okay, that's interesting. Um, you know, maybe it's a precursor to a phone call. Like, I don't know. And I listened to the video and like my heart just sank. Like, oh, yeah. what the hell? Like, I was just, I couldn't believe it. So, you know, just to kind of give you an idea of what happened, he he runs this um, show called Young Hustler. So people can call in, talk about their experience, get some support, et cetera, et cetera. So he started off this segment in the usual way. And he said, hang on a second, I just want to cut, cut, um, cut you off because I want to talk about Facebook. Um, I don't know if you've seen my recent post, I put a post up to Facebook execs and, you know, I said, I'm going to leave Facebook and this, that, the other. And then he went into a rant on me personally, saying that this guy, this Indian guy, and kind of talk, talking in a kind of racist undertone, um, is trying to give me advice on Facebook and talking about algorithms and this and that. But he was then saying, you know, I, I, you know, I know what I'm doing kind of thing. And for me, that was, that was I wouldn't say heartbreaking because I didn't love the guy. I looked up to him. But it was a feeling of disappointment, I think. You know, I, racism doesn't affect me. I've had, I've had decades of training on this. I'm, I'm quite well versed on different types of racism. It really didn't affect me at that level. But I felt really disappointed that here's a, a person of influence and power who's then set an example that this kind of uh, language and this kind of tone is okay. And for me, that was really, really disappointing to see. Um, and, and so, like, I, I was just in shock. Like, I didn't know. I, I just thought, like, what do you do really with disgusting. that? It was really disgusting. It was, it was really, like, you know, I, I, and I followed your feed ever since, and I see people talking on both sides of the issue. It's like, to me, it's like he took your advice as, as an assault on his ego in some way, and then instead of so. going back against you with any kind of, like, rationality, he literally resorted to, to, to calling out your race, to mangling your name, Absolutely. to talking about turmeric, like it mm, was it mm. was really disgusting to be honest with you. It and, was, and it, like, and, yeah. And, and I'd have no issue if he said this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. His advice is nonsense. You know what? I would have just walked away and life would have moved on. But to pull my skin color and, and to basically um, degrade me and demote my my race down because of my skin color and then to say that your advice is bad that was just absolutely uncalled for and he was and so, saying your advice was bad because you were like that that was implied in what he was saying too like oh here's here's this guy I think it felt like it felt like that you know yeah. and basically said you indians as in mm -hmm. like you know indians are all over his timeline and telling him what's best and what's not and um you know indians are running microsoft they're senior at google at adobe etc there's some some indians are fairly successful I would argue that I'm one of the most successful Indians running Facebook ads. You know, that's, we aren't so bad. But, you know, at the, end, at the bottom line is it doesn't matter about your skin color. You can agree or disagree with anyone's opinion. You can fight them on intellect or whatever it is, but there's just no need to bring skin color in. So, yeah, I, I literally just, I didn't know what to do. So I thought, the first thing was I left it. And a few hours went by, but it was just really kind of eating away at me. Like, how can someone so powerful and influential who has no need to even do this. Like, you have such a huge following, so much love from your fans. Why would you even want to do this? Like, okay, you might do it behind the scenes, and, and I get that. That's, that's you know, that, that's maybe something that happens, but why present that publicly? I just couldn't get my head around it. And he, so and then, he used it as a jumping-off point to really say, 
um, enough's enough. You know, he, he was, essentially Sorry. he was he was being offensive even beyond calling you know being racist. He was also sexist. He called people pussies. He you know like stopped short of calling people cucks. But basically he was like y'all's mama boy, mama's boys, and you need to recognize. You need to stand up to exactly. Facebook for, for this kind of thing. And and that particular issue there where he's all of a sudden, which he hasn't really done. He's done it in mm. like you say he's still running his, his campaigns, and and you can't really. Uh, you know, stop necessarily, but like, what do you make of that? Like that using that issue to try to to try to, you know, say you know you have to take a stand, otherwise you're 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 going to be you know steamrolled by this company. Yeah, so I think that's part of his makeup, which is you fight authority, you fight for what's right, you fight for what you want, and you know I haven't gone so deep into Grant Cardone's stuff that I fully understand it. I've just read some pieces um, around the 10x um, rule and things like that, so. You know, apparently this is the core of his philosophy, which is it's all about fighting and pushing and getting in people's faces and making yourself um, almost to the point where, you know, if you want to sell something, you become so irritating that someone will buy off you. And, and you know, that's a completely messed up philosophy. <laughs> um, but that, that's how we operate. And I think he's basically trying to push this agenda onto Facebook to say that we should all create an uprising basically to get, get his ad cost down. You know, like, what, yeah. what is your big goal of this? Just to get your ad cost down, really. You know, there are easier ways to do that. It's, it's just and you insane. were articulating them to him clearly. You stopped exactly. being so, so clickbaity and everything. And, so. and, well, the thing is, like, um, after that, so actually before I saw the video, I actually posted up in another thread that he put up, I put the actual formula of what I would do, like the four steps I would do to get his engagement back up, um, now, I then posted that on my own timeline. And, and what were they, just for the audience? What were the four things that you suggested to get his engagement back up? Sure. So one of the things he's struggling with is when he puts the posts up, they're just not getting engagement. They're not, they're not performing. Now, number one is that they're um, kind of baity, so Facebook's emoting them. But number two, like, I couldn't see any evidence of any testing. Like, and so what I suggested to him was run some testing on an ad. So what I would generally do with a large page like that, and I've done in the past, is create an ad using page post engagement, run the ad as if you're running a, page, a, 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 a post on your actual wall. So whatever kind of message you want to put it, put it in there, but test variants of it as well. And then what you do is to pull out the variant that's getting the most engagement, and then you run that as a normal post on your page. Once you've got that on your post, you then give it, a slight paid boost to get it in front of the right people, warm the algorithm up, show it that show the algorithm that the post is getting engagement, and then let organic do its thing. And that's that's as simple as it was. Um, yeah. And I kind of mockingly called it the GC 10x fan page formula, just as a kind of ode <laughs> to Hunt Cardone and his woes and things like that. I posted post it on my wall. I shared it with Grant on his wall. So I literally offered to I, I literally offered to speak to him about how to improve his engagement. I gave his team the exact strategy that they should use to get his engagement up um, and then followed that kind of run. So that's where I didn't quite understand, like, how do you go from saying, hey, I'd love to get you on a call to saying this guy doesn't know anything and I'm going to attack his race. It just did not make sense whatsoever. It's very strange. I, I, I saw the, the, the hashtag boycott Cardone going around, but I would, I would rather see the hashtag, like, get Depeche, like, have Grant hire Depeche, I, and, I, and I want to see what happens because I believe you could. Like I believe if you went into his team and and were able to apply some of the things you've learned over the past, you know, five years run, running these ads, like you could probably seriously help his efforts. Absolutely, and and the thing is, like if he didn't do the video, if he just jumped on the call, I was happy to give him free advice. You know, for me to d then say I had given Grant Cardone free advice on Facebook advertising. Imagine what I could do with you. I, I didn't want any money from him. I don't need that kind of, um, I didn't, didn't need his business. If he then come forward now and apologize and said, you know, I want you on my team, all that kind of stuff, honestly, I wouldn't do it. No yeah. amount of payment would um, cover up because, you know, the other thing I didn't realize is his, his, his level of disrespect for different races goes so, so deep. It really is. You know, I've seen some videos since of him mocking lots of different races and that isn't on, you know, this isn't just like someone commented on my post and saying, you know, it's probably a slip up and he didn't mean it or something like that. Or, you know, he's not really racist. He's just having a joke and stuff like that. You can't, as someone dishing out something which is perceived as racism, say whether it's racist or not. It's the recipient that feels it. And mm. if the recipient feels it, then there has to be an element of truth in it. 
if then thousands of people also say it's racism, then you're probably wrong. And so there's like, um, yeah, he's just, I can't understand the people that are saying that it isn't racist. It is. There's no grading. You can't say it's mildly racist or it isn't, whatever. It's either is or isn't. Um, yeah. And, you know, I know it is mild racism. It's not It's not the worst I've ever seen. It won't be the worst I've ever seen. But it's racism any, in any case. Um, and this is not just about me and what happened with, within the video. I wanted to then make a point and make an example of Grant Condone that it is not okay to use your power and influence to think that you can do what you want. And especially in a position of power and influence, people look up to you. People look up to you for validation. We see this happening with lots of world leaders where they say something publicly and their, their followers are like, yeah, you know, my leader says it's acceptable and so now I'm going to do this. Yep. I, you know, that, that same video... Dog fact, whistling like, sort of, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that video that Grant Cardone did, I, I did skip through to see what else he was talking about. And in one of the parts, he said to whoever was calling up, I'm going to come round your house and shoot you personally. Now, what kind of message does that give out to someone who's maybe not, slight, not, not balanced in their mind, also has a gun, maybe has a grudge against someone, and says, oh, right, so Grant Cardone says it's okay to shoot people. That, that's like completely irresponsible. It really is. Yeah, he's one of those guys, and this, I wanted to get into this a little bit because you know we're we're both in the you know you you've got courses coming out if you you, you don't already you do masterminds and things like that, and 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 I you know one of the things that we're trying to do at iStack Training all the time is is walk the line of working with the the best people in the game who aren't gurus right who aren't you know one of our things is we we, we work with people who are making more money doing marketing and doing entrepreneurship exactly. than they are selling their information, uh, yeah. and I feel like he's crossed that line a long time ago. Uh, with, with with how much he's making, and you can just see, you know, the difference between a guru and an educator in in your two. You, you know, you're offering to help here, and he's taking it as an attack on on his ego, and then resorting to racism. And to me, it's a, a really interesting point of reference when it comes to that difference between educators and gurus. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I think you know that it's. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, like there there are genuine people that want to improve the world, right? And and there are people who say, I want to improve the world, but they don't want to change themselves and they, they still have these values which don't align with the majority of people. Um, and, you know, I think it's a case with, in particular, in this particular case with Grant Cardone, whatever his values are, you know, I had an email, uh, I had a messenger message from the co-host, Jared, who said, dude, you know, I heard about your, um, your, your um, post and stuff like that. So, you know, the first thing I would say is a massive, massive thank you to those people that supported this and got that video and that post out to Grant. I know he's seen it now because his co-host has seen it. So he messaged me and said, look, you know, it was, it was tongue in cheek. It was a joke. We do this all the time. Grant also gets attacked on his religion, on his, the, the other, other bits and pieces. It's all just kind of forward and backward um, camaraderie or whatever it is. And, you know, specifically, he said Grant isn't a racist. He's got um, friends of many different nationalities, and he also gives willingly to charities, regardless of skin color and things like that. Now, you know, that's absolutely great. I love the fact that he's charitable and he's doing his bit for humanity. That's great. But there's also respect. And, and I think that's where he's fallen over massively. And through the videos I've seen, he just does not have respect for for lots of different people, races, background culture whatever it is and i think his levels of respect bad. are are affected by race like the, the you know just by it by a presupposition of some with a person with a name that sounds like this which like or who eats food like this or it was exactly. uh, it, it was really disgusting to see so uh, you know the uh, the comments that 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 you know, like i there's so many comments and you've received you say mostly positive comments you've had some negative ones like oh relax but there's a lot of comments from friends that are close to you that that say like don't let this bog you down don't let mm. this and i know you're not i know, like like that's that's not it's not something that's going to derail you in any way but at the same time it's important to kind of take a stand and and, and for, for what you believe it is, you know, I'm massively outside my comfort zone. You know, I'm just a marketer, entrepreneur, doing my thing, running a business, helping clients, all that kind of stuff. Like, I, I never woke up and said, right, today I'm going to fight racism. Like, I'm not oppressed. I'm, I'm living in no. the UK. Um, it's a great country. I'm enjoying it. I'm also of Indian descent. And I'm, you know, I, I love my life, my my business and things like that. So I, ne I didn't wake up and said, right, I'm going to fight this. But I'm going to be a martyr today. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it and like an opportunity came up and I took the ch opportunity 
to share that. So Friday evening UK time, I thought I'd share that on my newsfeed just to let people know who were friends that, that I know were following Grant Cardone to just know how he operates. Because I, you know, from the previous post where I said I'm super excited to um, potentially work with Grant Cardone, had like a, a few hundred likes and comments and things saying that's that's absolutely amazing, you know, to look up to someone and for that person to ask for your help and all that kind of stuff. And then for this to happen, I needed to share that message, and I expected a few hundred people to respond. That video is now close to twenty thousand views, and I have no idea how that happened, but it has. And like my messenger inbox has exploded, uh, my friends request, notifications of people commenting. Um, and literally I spent the whole weekend on this whole thing. Like I, my projects are behind, my training courses lie, but lots of emails didn't go out, um, some client work slightly behind, but it's important. You know, for me, I've never had this before. I'm making this up as I go along. I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Maybe it just completely dies dead, but there is still a message and the amount of support I've had, even from people who have been um, kind of cyber bullied in forums and um, have been sent hate messages because they believe certain things that other people didn't and now saying you know you've really inspired us to stand up yeah you know that, that that's just amazing the, the kind of opportunity to have that kind of level of impact is amazing now is there not not to derail anything but is there anything that can be done like you know we, we talked earlier about seo and google and i i came up doing sem and building a business on the back of a giant is challenging can be challenging yeah. is there and, and you're, we're doing the same thing now with facebook right uh, you know um, um, all of our ad spend is on facebook most of our ad spends on facebook most of yours is i'm sure as well is there anything as marketers that we can do uh when it comes to because you know obviously you know he's doing these kinds of posts that aren't that aren't gaining the, the, the traction that he wants but fa but there is also a story where facebook has been reducing organic reach that that people have paid to build over over years that's right like what? Where do as marketers who are building a business on the back of these behemoths? Like, what is our place and what is our role to stand up or to conform? Where do you where do you fall on that? Yeah, so I think look with um with with any kind of basket that you can put your eggs into, you do need to diversify. And any business that we work with, even though we focus on Facebook ads, I'm always advising as a marketing expert that you need to diversify. You need to continue running your page search. You need to continue building your list and nurturing your list and things like that. And Facebook is the the big kind of central part for many of these clients. But it's kind of bringing bringing together your kind of ads and your. Oh, this is just like the BBC interview. I love it. <laughs> it is sorry. Um, so yeah, it's sorry. like just trying to get your game together so that you understand how the different parts of Facebook work. So for example. I've diversified into groups. You know, I'm a Facebook ads expert. I'm now running a group. I had no plan to run a group, but now all of a sudden, lots of people are messaging me for support, and someone suggested rather than just doing it in Messenger, run a group. I've done that, and there's a few thousand people there now I can have a one-to-many conversation with. I still run ads. I'm still building my list. I'm still running ads for my clients, but groups is now another bow to that. Fan pages, if you have purpose, if you've got content, you've got... Um, consistency and you know how to engage that's another bow in your kind of um, armory as well Instagram WhatsApp messenger they're all just kind of different parts of building up your marketing program and I think you know as a marketer yeah you, you absolutely need to be cognizant of the fact that you're working on borrowed land whether it's Facebook yep. Instagram WhatsApp anything like that but at the same time you need to grab as much out of that platform as you can um, and I think it's just making sure you're using those different parts in the right way. So, for example, fan pages, you know, Facebook have been quite clear the pages that they're going to favor, they're going to be niche. They're going to be um, highly relevant to those followers. Like they gave the example of sports um, teams and things like that that have really passionate followers. They mentioned the fact that they look at engagement, not just by likes, shares and comments, but almost like the, le the number of words in the comments and how many pe people are creating nested comments. They've given you all that information. Now, your goal is how do I create content that's going to engage, create conversation, and, and get people motivated to keep, keep that kind of interest going? And there are a number of pages doing this extremely well. But, you know, it's, it's, it's getting harder and harder. And that's where I think a lot of people trip themselves up is trying to continually repeat what used to work and then complain when it doesn't. Facebook ads is exactly the same. You know, I can't run all of the strategies I ran two, three, four years ago. It doesn't work. You have to adapt. A lot of the things I use right now are things that I've only discovered in the last three months or maybe in the last six months. But then we adapt and we test and move on. 
and they're not doing it as a cash grab. That's the other thing you mentioned earlier. It's not ju- it might might be a tertiary benefit of it, but it's not. They're doing it to improve the experience, which will improve everything for everyone, right? hundred percent. You know, I I had the privilege of being quite deep inside Facebook, working with um, different teams within Facebook, and they really really buy into the whole purpose and the whole mission statement that. Mark Zuckerberg's been talking about, about connecting communities and bringing people closer together. They really, really believe in that. And I really do believe that from the top down, especially from Zuckerberg, it's not about the money. The money enables him to do the things he wants. Now, if you speak to Sheryl Sandberg, then maybe it's a bit more about the money because that's her responsibility is to run a company. Mark's responsibility is to always be looking two, five, ten years out and say, where does Facebook need to be? He's a, he's, he's a typical entrepreneur. He's detached himself from running a business. He's now developing new ways of making Facebook achieve its goal. Um, I, I saw recently, for example, someone did a Facebook Live on their, um, on their virtual reality headset. Hmm. I mean, that, that was like, I just saw that. It's like, that, that's insane. Now, all of a sudden, you can run Facebook Lives and invite people into your virtual environment and talk as if you're physically there. So Facebook Live is great. It gives people a platform to talk directly live to people on their news feed. But now the virtual reality side of it with Oculus enables you to actually invite people into your environment. So all, from all around the world, you could run a mastermind or a forum right from your house. Like that's, yeah. Just think about the marketing opportunities there, and it's just going to keep leveling, leveling up like that. Yeah, I, I agree. I was uh, talking with my wife about this, and you know, we've we've invested we invested in Facebook a, a little while ago, and the stock's taking a hit. And we, Carrie was saying something like, "Well, the, the stock is still well above Coca Cola," and I was just <laughs> I, I, I thought about that for a second. I thought, okay, you've got sugar water, and you've got like the most advanced like human relational system sort of ever created, Absolutely. and it's like it's still massively undervalued in in the long run and it's like there there's been Absolutely. a pile on happening over the last little while and I think that's what Grant Card- Cardone did he know like every day there's a new story kicking Facebook basically and so he thought well I'll take a shot as well at this is my moment to take a shot at them and uh and I don't see it like people are people are talking about you know th- this bringing it down I just don't see that as as an option I I just see Facebook as as a as a real institution it's like you know 30% of people's lives in a lot of ways right are 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 spent this this way, and it's Absolutely. easy to talk about the ways that it's changed us. That that might be, you know, that it's not always the best experience, but it's yep. it's a, a net positive, I think, for sure, for in my life, easily. Yeah, I completely agree with that. You know, and like I, I gave the example earlier of enabling people to have social interactions that may not otherwise have been able to have them, but like you this? know, people compare. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Facebook compa- uh, Facebook's been compared to MySpace, and you know, they talk about MySpace and what happened, what went wrong. It's not comparable. It is not comparable at all. There's no other platform in the world that can give you what Facebook gives. And you know, even from a marketer's point of view, there is no other platform on the planet that allows you to laser target like you can in Facebook. Now, from our point of view as a marketer, that's absolutely amazing. Obviously, what's going to change now is the la- level of laser targeting is going to change because of the whole data and privacy side. But I still guarantee that there still won't be a platform that comes close to Facebook, at least in the next few years, because of the way they're able to um, emerge what essentially is TV advertising, which was getting into your place of pleasure and serving an ad when you're in the kind of relaxed mindset, but being able to also do that at mass reach like TV does but also be able to really, really segment that down and target people highly. So, um, you know, for example, some cable companies have started to experiment with this over the last few years. I've been running TV ads for um, six, seven years now, and they've now started to serve up segments of demographics. So you can target by um, you know, age, gender, and things like that by household, number of children live in there, the type of programs they watch. So they're starting to get down into the um, more kind of Facebook style of yeah, yeah, granularity that Facebook offers you, but they're, they're they're miles away from where Facebook are. The level of targeting and the relevancy as well. You know why why do people buy off Facebook? You know people are not being forced to buy things. It's not like people are um, you know all you see in the news feed is ad 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 and that's all people do. Mm. Yet people are buying in the billions off of Facebook, and and the reason is because of relevancy and Facebook enables that. And um, you you give that up as a user. You give up yeah. your data by having free access to this platform. I think I saw a stat um, a couple of months ago which said that if we were to actually 
pay for Facebook access and still give them the same revenue, it'd be something like $10 a month or $10 a year, which is like tiny, tiny. But that's what you're giving up for your data. And, and like, if, if the option was there to pay for Facebook, 25, 50, maybe 70% of people just wouldn't choose to do it. Yet yeah. we're willingly giving up our data and making Facebook billions in, 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 re, in return. And there has to be a trade-off. You either pay for it and get no ads, or you don't pay for it and you get the ads. And that's kind of where we are right now. Or you pick up, you know, you do it yourself. If you see something out there you don't like, you start a counter campaign or something like that, right? That's like true. everyone sort of has access to the same tools, which is one of the things, the, the sort of democratic nature of, of Facebook, which is, uh, which is why it's potentially so dangerous to, like, to the global order in a way, right? Because, because it that's does right. turn over the hand you know, in, into potential rogue actors. But it's sort yeah. of like I, I'm a fan of it because of that democratic nature. You know what I mean? Like we all have the same yeah. power to get our message out, and uh, and I think that's that's pretty amazing. And, and I think one of the um, interesting things I don't know if you've seen is that Mark Zuckerberg's looking into blockchain and what role could blockchain play for Facebook. The role it could play is, you know, the, the amount of power that Facebook have in their hands right now is immense. Now, if they were to pass that over to blockchain, which allows them to decentralized power, then all of a sudden you've got the most powerful social um, platform on the planet being owned by the people using it. Yeah. And, and that's just a whole different way of thinking about things. With a whole other level of accountability that could enable things like direct democracy, perhaps, you know, like when you're actually, when that's the kind of cool power of the blockchain to me is that, that sort of ability to, uh, to, 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 to have accountability. So, and it's, it's kind of scary at the same time. So it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Depeche, I, and I, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. We're at an hour here. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you further, I'm sure you're being inundated all, all around. But uh, drop the name of your group again and any other way that you might want people to, to reach out. Yeah, sure. So absolutely. The, the best way is to join the Facebook Ads Academy for Entrepreneurs and Marketers on Facebook. Um, and it's really aimed at people who are already advertising on Facebook to level up their game. Um, feel free to connect with me on Facebook if you want. Um, probably not right now because of this whole Cardone thing has exploded. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're generally the, the ways to kind of get in touch and kind of keep up. I do have a, a page as well, Mr. Deepesh Mandalia, if you want to follow me on there as well. Nice. Any closing thoughts? Closing thoughts are on Facebook. You know, just ride the waves right now. I know there's a lot of people struggling with their performance. I just had someone recently reach out and say, you know, I spent 50K a month and last month we had huge losses and we're struggling. Reduce your spend down. Reduce your losses. Ride the wave. It will get better. But how long it takes, I just don't know. But absolutely keep, um, keep the faith with Facebook. Um, and if you have an opportunity to positively impact people as well, absolutely take the opportunity. Nice. I fully agree. Depeche, thank you so much for coming on The Robust Marketer today. And uh, we'll try to get, the, out, get this out as soon as possible. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll let you know when it's out. Thank you. Appreciate you having me, man. Thanks. Ch cheers.